So, in continuation of the topic remote sensing and GIS application in agriculture and NRM, in this part 3, we will be discussing about the role or uses of remote sensing in agriculture. We mentioned it, discussed it also that how you know different um, way remote sensing and GIS can be useful for various purposes, land use and, and capability we have discussed about. Now, today we will look at that how remote sensing can actually help in studying different aspect of agriculture. Remote sensing, it provides several types of special information that we have already discussed like information about soil, land use, land cover, vegetation index, soil moisture. So, a fraction of the absorbed photosynthetically active radiation that we call FAPR, crop biophysical condition data like leaf area index, crop height, canopy cover, stem width, above ground biomass, crop biochemical parameters like your leaf color, chlorophyll content, uh, various other aspect which are crucial for crop model performances for computing evapotranspiration biomass yield. Because these are the aspects that we need to know, need to study about agriculture. And if you recall that in the modeling lectures, we discussed in great detail that how inputs comes from different climate model, remote sensing or information, these all also can come and can be integrated today in a couple manner. So, we also discussed if you recall that, that how a coupling of hydrological model, crop model can also be done and utilization of artificial intelligence, GIS, remote sensing, these days are possible. Now, remote sensing can also represent the missing data and can that describe the crop conditions throughout the various crop growth stages. I have given you often the example of rice because most of us actually you know well aware of the rice crop and rice crop has you know different stages and very different color and also structure. So, remote sensing can be used very efficiently to find out missing data and also the crop conditions across the different crop growth stages. Remote sensing can also minimize the unpredictability of spatial information, especially which are associated with crop models. Remember, in crop modeling lectures, we discussed that, that in crop modeling, we try to mimic the natural condition and we try to close as much as possible. There also remote sensing play important role. The information of remote sensing can be used in crop model and the resolutions or the spatial informations about a particular crop in a certain area actually can be improved by the help of good quality remote sensing data. The remote sensing application in agriculture began with the large area crop inventory experiment, which we call LACI. LACI used land sand data to estimate you know crop production. So, especially you know in developed country where you have huge amount of land covered under single crop, there certainly you will get you know very very useful uh, you know remote sensing information. But in case of India, here as the you know land size is small, probably in one land to the very next land you can have two different type of crops. Yet remote sensing can help us to understand the different you know crop coverage in an area. Unmanned aerial vehicle UAV, all of you are aware of UAV system has become very popular in various developed country as well as it is now slowly coming you know into use in our country because UAV technology UAV system can be used for crop water status detection means how much water is there whether you need to apply irrigation or not. One of the major concern in case of irrigated agriculture is that we irrigate even when it is not required. 
and irrigation means utilization of energy electricity huge amount of ground water wastage so uav can help you to understand the crop water status and thus you will be able to actually irrigate the field when it is needed it can also help you to estimate plant you know density crop biophysical parameter and also various other you know aspect of agriculture uav can provide us very high resolution images and as you know if we get high resolution images certainly our evaluation of the cropping area estimation of various resources everything will be almost error free but having said that there are few limitations of uav as well such as it has a very small area coverage and also very insufficient flight time means after certain time it has to come down you have to get it down and then again you know send it up because there are also certain issues with with its energy how long it can actually fly so these are few issues which are still being addressed at the r&d level optical remote sensing data has almost perfected the estimation of leaf area index and biomass with the help of high spatial resolution images because if you get high resolution images then actually it is very very easy to actually capture the real fact of the ground better the quality of the picture better will be your outcome of the analysis now sar also have several application synthetic aperture radar has also have several application in crop canopy state variable estimation like leaf area index crop height biomass estimation sar also has the capability in acquiring information even in the presence of clouds and that is advantageous in case of agriculture research especially indian agriculture where you know you get often cloud cover we have you know a long rainy season also and various parts gets rains in different time so in our situation sar can be a useful tool now satellite based estimation of evapotranspiration this is an another utilization of satellite based technology surface energy balance algorithm for land this is what we call as sibel this is actually used and it is based on the surface energy balance theory the model it computes a complete radiation and energy balance along with the resistance for momentum heat water vapor transport for each pixel okay for each pixel so this is the equation that is used for this okay lambda et equal to r n minus g minus h what are those lambda et is evapotranspiration that is derived in terms of instantaneous latent heat flux okay r n is net radiation that's the unit g stands for soil heat flux h stands for sensible heat flux and then net radiation is computed the land surface radiation balance as r n equal to 1 minus delta alpha into r sin plus r lin minus r log out l out minus 1 minus phi 0 into r lin so this particular you know equation helps you to get the net radiation which is expressed as r n now r sin equal is actually the incoming short wave solar radiation where alpha is the surface albedo r lin incoming long wave solar radiation then outgoing long wave solar radiation land surface emissivity epsilon 0 g is empirically related to ndvi how as g by r n is equal to t s by alpha and then you have it this particular equation where t s stands for surface temperature in kelvin the expression for sensible heat flux is given by this equation 
h is equal to rho C p d t by r a h, where rho is the air density, C p stands for specific heat capacity of the air, d t is the near surface temperature difference in Kelvin, r a h is the aerodynamic resistance to heat transport. So, these are the different way that you actually get the various estimations under several calculation. The in several model T s and delta T are actually related linearly as you see here d T equal to A T s plus B it is a linear equation A or B are calibration parameter and these are calibrated on the basis of the knowledge of two boundary conditions identified within the image itself and d t values can be back calculated using a known age at the two pixel. So, you have cold pixel and you will have hot pixel. Okay? So, A and B require a choice of two pixel representing the extreme condition of the temperature and humidity and these two extreme condition one is hot and the other is cold pixel. The cold pixel is a well you know irrigated crop surface with full cover and the surface temperature T s will be close to the air temperature T a, but the hot pixel is a dry bare agricultural land where lambda e t is assumed to be 0. So, these two pixel tie the calculation for all other pixels between these two points. And iterative way started from the neutral stability assumption is generally conducted for the sensible heat flux estimation and you do it using the atmospheric stability corrections. Okay? So, several model in fact allow you to understand the different extremes of weather events like humidity, temperature because ultimately you are going to also calculate the evapotranspiration. So, the instantaneous evaporative fraction is computed using this equation. Okay? So, the ratio of the actual to the crop evaporative demand especially when the atmospheric moisture conditions are in equilibrium with the soil moisture condition. So, that is what is your instantaneous evaporative fraction. Now, this fraction is almost constant within daytime hours and thus it allows to use as a temporal integration parameter. Now, G can be neglected for time scales of one day or longer. In case of daily time scale, your evapotranspiration for 24 hours can be computed through this equation. Here are the details about different parameter. This I am just you know sharing with you because these are the aspect which is required probably when you want to go very deep into remote sensing and GIS. But under this course, I am just giving you some highlight of the application of uh, different satellite based technologies for natural resource management. So, if you want to get into further detail, if you are interested to learn, then you have to take a, a completely separate course on remote sensing and GIS. Now, if you look at the uh, several structure, so it actually starts with your TM image, visible NIR also SWIR band under that whatever information that you are capturing through the satellite, spatial registration takes place, digital elevation model data is also required, surface meteorological data also needed. So, when these are with you, then you go for you know NDVI surface albedo, surface temperature, surface emissivity, all this kind of analysis or function that you can actually run. Then through this, you can get net radiation soil heat flux. You can also get internal interaction based on you know uh, various equations. Once you get net radiation soil heat flux, you go towards energy balance, then instantaneous evaporated fractions that you get which I discussed here. Once you get instantaneous evaporative fraction, then you go to the next stage invariableness of evaporation rate and then finally, you calculate actual daily evapotranspiration. So, 
your ultimate aim is to get that per day how much actually water is getting evapotranspirated because that will actually tells you that how much water is present there and how much water you need to put back into the soil in the form of irrigation or otherwise. Now GIS geographic information system this is a tool information system which is applied for representing your you know various data analysis in a very user friendly manner. So, this tool uses geographically referenced data as well as non spatial data and also includes different spatial analysis as well. GIS also helps in you know decision making for land, water, all natural resources, you know transportation, even geology, oceans, anything you can actually see in front of you in a pictorial form. So, for GIS to work with GIS you need good quality hardware, software, data, various methodology and also skilled manpower. Now, there are few open source for this GIS tool like ArcGIS, Adras, you know Imagine, MapInfo, Idrisi, Infograph, Autodex, various commercial also aspects. So, these are actually basically the commercial one and uh, these are the open source. Okay. So, ArcGIS, Adras, MapInfo, this one has to buy actually procure the right to work with, but there are few are which are available in the uh, free domain like QGIS, GrassGIS, SagaGIS, NV, ILWS. So, these are some of the software and then application of GIS are plenty. We already discussed in the previous you know lectures in natural resource management, hazard disaster management, agriculture, transportation, livelihood, socio-economic aspect, networking and telecommunication, urban and rural planning, any kind of decision making processes GIS plays a very, very important role. So, if you look at the data types that you know GIS tool uses, they are basically vector and raster data. Vector data are in the form of point, line or polygon, raster data that are described by cell grid. Okay, one value per cell. Then you have attribute data that are non-spatial characteristics that are connected by tables to points, lines or events and polygons in some cases also grid cells. Now, you know in case of GIS interpolation, if you want to have you know GIS interpolations, then nearest neighbor one is method, then inverse distance weight is another method, Krieging is one very, very popular method, then spline you can do bilinear interpolation. These are various you know kind of you know methods that people uses for various kind of interpolations within GIS platform. These are the various uh, GIS uh, data layers uh, in general one can actually uh, see it. So, you have elevation, hydrology, transportation, soils, geology, ownership, site data, imagery. So, various you know data layers that you can actually put one after the other. GIS map layers for groundwater recharge is very interesting and a lot of work has been carried out across the world. So, especially for groundwater uh, recharge if somebody wants to uh, study then you can see that that you need uh, various layers uh, means various uh, level various type of information lithology map is one slope gradient map drainage density map lineament density map land use map and soil map so all these information layer after layer in gis actually you put in and then these all these layers will interact with the, with, with each other you analyze and then finally you can calculate the groundwater potential index utilizing various layers those are mentioned above okay so in gis you can actually you know carry out various kind of interactions also you can overlay one layer above the others you can actually find out the interrelation between uh, various layers so those kind of you know different analysis also are possible within gis platform gis map layers of aquifer vulnerability is another uh, very interesting field that people actually 
work a lot and there are many studies available. So in understand the aquifer vulnerability, especially people study in drought prone area, you will find that they will get uh, different information layer, depth of water table, net recharge, aquifer media, soil media, topography, impact to windows zone, hydraulic conductivity. So all these layer after layer they will put and then these layers actually can uh, even interact uh, with each other then you can carry out various interactive analysis to find out you know the aquifer vulnerability. There are also lot of studies available using you know GIS tool, GIS map layers of agricultural pollution potential. So there people who actually have various layers like watershed, slope, soil, land use, animal loading, agricultural pollution potential the final. So interaction with all these uh, you know uh, layers then finally they can find out the agriculture pollution potential through the interactions of various layers of information within GIS platform. So this actually gives you very clear cut information um, which is visible and this also helps uh, you know to present your study in a very meaningful manner and also uh, you know for layman suppose people who are not expert of GIS they can see the picture and looking at the maps they can understand okay this area is uh, require our attention. Uh, if policy makers you are sharing your result with the policy makers they will appreciate when you actually show your uh, understanding your analysis result through this kind of you know GIS maps. So that is what I think that uh, these days for any kind of study especially in the field of natural resource management GIS plays a very very important role for data representation. Mm -hmm.